I could have gone a lot of uh, directions in, in life. I was always like a really solid student. I had like pretty high GPA, like SAT scores. Like I could have been an engineer. Or, like, it's a hard question to answer because in a lot of ways it doesn't make any sense. The most intelligent and impactful and inspiring individuals I've ever met in my life were musicians. Probably the first of those people were my band directors and teachers. And then I met people like Wynton Marsalis and Stefan Harris, and I got to spend time around them and just how deeply they knew people, they knew culture, they knew history. And uh, once I had role models like that, it's like, uh, what else are you going to do? <laughs> When I got into jazz, it was in seventh grade. If I'm being very honest, it was probably all the wrong reasons. <laughs> like, <laughs> coming from an Asian American background, everything that was preached to me by my, my folks at the time was about com academic success and about competitiveness. And I found out there was this like all state jazz competition, and there was these like etudes like essentially classical etudes but in the bebop idiom let's say and i just i learned the shit out of them <laughs> now knowing a lot more about what this music is about <laughs> it's kind of a funny way to get into it but i just studied that those etudes and i wanted to be an all-state musician but it shifted for me extremely rapidly just becoming very obsessive about count basie charlie parker miles davis coltrane and all these things it it, it shifted from that thing within like I would say a year or two into just like a super passionate jazz lover. It dawns on every young person who's going into school for music or something at some point like, oh, I'm getting paid, you know, 50, 75, 100 bucks per gig, and my rent alone, you know, is like 1,000, 1,500 a month or something like that. And like, how many gigs, like, if I play a gig every night, am I? can I get a gig every night? <laughs> and uh, is that something I want? It's achievable, and that's one of the things that I love about New York is there's role models and people who've been doing it for decades. And then, like I said, when I went to Amsterdam and I had a lot more free time away from the busyness of the city to you know, rediscover myself. I discovered I really like being a nerd <laughs> and dealing with technology and uh, microphones it came into the picture and cables grew up with technology so that was always something I, I knew to have but I just got more serious about it over the past I don't know three four years it's a very practical skill for a modern musician to have it got me thinking how important being in the studio was and how much we lack that these days because back in the day the labels they chose artists to represent and they funded that because they felt like they could make a profit. And now if you want to make a studio record, it's like, that's all out of your pocket. So I went to Michael and I was like, let's start a music studio that's owned by jazz musicians, hella affordable and caters to the music that we care about rather than like taking whatever artist has the most money, you know? COVID. Yeah, there were no venues to play in, and audiences were so scared of gathering for, you know, valid reasons. I wanted a way to perform for people. Let's live stream to your, to your laptop, to your phone. That was, that was the most natural way. Uh, so the first group was my good friend Joe Giordano, who's a trombonist. But I just remember how good it sounded and generated several hundred dollars in ticket sales. It was quite a realization, like, we can do this all the time, like every week. And then the day of, or sometimes 
before if I have time. I'm making an input list. I'm picking the best microphones for each person. Some type of, I guess, stage plot or room plot of where people are going to go. Setting up cameras, the video switcher, making sure everything's configured right on the PCs. Uh, then there's artist management. Once they arrive, like this person forgot this cable. This person like needs a glass of water, and this person like desperately needs coffee. These are real human problems that you have to deal with when you're. Putting on concerts with other people. You go live, play the show, and break down. Actually, one note about the bed. So now this is actually the upgraded setup. I had a blow up mattress that I would deflate the day of a stream and stick it in a closet so I had the whole room just to be a studio. You know, this is just a New York City apartment. Sometimes I'd be so tired after the day of a stream that I'd be too lazy to inflate the mattress again at night. And so I just crash on my own couch. <laughs> and so now this bed is permanent. It's literally like less than a twin size bed on a camping cot. It's actually an upgrade, believe it or not. <laughs> had these tunes that I had written, you know, throughout various periods of college. And what, what actually uh, put it together for me is when I wrote the liner notes for the record. I went to a park. I didn't bring my phone or a laptop or anything. I just brought uh, a notebook and a pen. I just wrote down all my thoughts about what this music meant to me and what it symbolized in my life. And I realized that this was important music to me. I wanted this music documented, which it was, and released in the most beautiful manner I could muster. So, you know, I wrote the liner notes and I was like, wow, this, this music is from like all these different years of me growing up. All of a sudden it was a project. I Am Me. It's a composition on the album as well as the, the album itself. And it's this poem I wrote back in, in college yeah you know during college you're kind of discovering yourself and I realized a lot of the people I was growing with, up with had like pretty similar personalities to me come from a lot of like Asian American backgrounds from this like suburban city and then when I came to New York I was like wow people are not like me and so when I was discovering this I felt like I felt like who I was as a person was incongruent with uh, who society wanted to, me to be with what I needed to be in a capitalist society to make a living and since then I've become more confident in myself and I've appreciated my strengths and I've changed some of the lyrics of that poem from a place of like can I be happy in me to be like you have to be you <laughs> to be happy you know I titled the record I am me I finally had the, the confidence to say hey this is me this is how I sound today uh, take it or leave it and I am me so yeah, it's just a very personal record of melodies that came out of my soul and <laughs> these different points in my life. You know, it's, it's music I feel very passionate about. I wouldn't do all this shit for it if I didn't. <laughs> I love improvising. I love beautiful songs. It's just, a, it's just a joy that can never be found at a desk or even in other mediums of art as far as just playing my saxophone and swinging and <laughs> it's, it's it's something I, I don't think I could live without.